afternoon. We have a nice group here today. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Pat O'Bannon, and this is your Tuckahoe Town Meeting. Uh, we have a, a, some interesting material to cover today. First, I want to say why we are here today. Uh, at my town meetings, I select what town meetings are going to, the topics are going to be by the number of phone calls I receive from people. And this, I believe, may have been advertised a little bit differently. This, this particular town meeting was because I got lots of phone calls from people who said they didn't understand what the yellow arrow was on the traffic signal, or they didn't know why they had to stop when the green means go. And it says on the sign over the, the signal, you know, yield right of way or yield to oncoming traffic, even though it's green. What has been advertised is that this is about intersections and streets that are not safe, but that wasn't where we were going to go. This wasn't going to be the topic, but we will include that because I have gotten some emails. Um, we also have had one of the things we were, are going to touch on is pedestrian safety and bicyclist safety. That was another issue that I've gotten lots of calls on. So that was what it was, it was intended to be, was driver safety, and there are refresher courses you can take or you may take if you haven't seen the new type of signals, or, as I said, bicycle and pedestrian safety. So we may advertise this again and do it again either in the summer or in the early fall with something similar. So those of you online, if you have questions, by the way, I have already gotten questions that we will cover uh, and have gotten some emails that we will go over. So we are the, the folks who are here to talk, to really talk, have prepared for this. But first, the county has understands that pedestrian safety has been, is an issue now in the county. Um, even as, as recently as 15 years ago, I did a survey, and the response on that was that people did not want sidewalks. But then I tried it again about 10 years ago, and people had really changed their minds. They did want lots of sidewalks. Sidewalks have been the policy of the Board of Supervisors for more than 20 years, but it was only on new construction. Putting in sidewalks in older areas houses that were built in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and even into the 1990s, did not have sidewalks. People did not want them. So retrofitting sidewalks is very difficult. You need a curb and a gutter. You need to measure the road and put the curb and gutter at the what's called the ultimate right-of-way to the actual, list, actual way, the size of the uh, width of the road, that it was intended to be, and it may take out people's shrubs, part of their driveway. Again, it may cause a drainage problem. And so by doing it that way, the cost, by having to put in a curb and gutter and sidewalk, the cost is, um, has been, is, is up to about $750 a foot to put in a sidewalk, because you have to do all this engineering and some other work. So it is difficult and takes time to add sidewalk in the older neighborhoods, which is why I have concentrated on in areas like Parham Road and Wakasan Road to put in more and more sidewalks because people want to walk to a shopping center or a school or that sort of thing. And you can walk through the neighborhood and get there. But we have put in hundreds of miles of sidewalks in the last few years, and we will continue to do that. I mean, we as in the board. But we have found that by putting in sidewalks, people don't know what they're supposed to do when they step off the curb. <laughs> We've been without them, I guess, for so long that we need to teach people pedestrian safety, and of course we've heard about the bicyclists, so bicycle safety, and the motorist safety goes along with that. So. We're going to start with this video that was produced, and it is on YouTube if you want to look at it. For those of you who are watching us online, or you're watching us online, and this is in the future, and this is um, something you want to see or to, to see a better view of it, it's on YouTube. If you go to Henrico County, you can uh, go to YouTube, Henrico County Town Meetings, and you can see these town meetings in the future. And if your camera person will 
perhaps scan a little bit and see that we have a good crowd here today, and I'm very glad to see that, because even if you aren't a pedestrian and you aren't a bicyclist, if you are a driver, you need to understand the pedestrian bicyclist safety too. So let's start with the video, and then I'm going to introduce you to a couple people here that are here to talk about the traffic safety of drivers, driver safety, and how you can help that, and also the police officer who would give you a ticket if you don't do it right. <laughs> so let's see the video first, and we'll get started. Thank you. Across Enrico County, we have seen an alarming increase in the number of automobile crashes involving pedestrians and bicyclists. Sadly, many of these incidents have resulted in a death or serious injury. Crashes are often preventable. Be alert and limit your distractions, and please use sidewalks where available. At night, carry a flashlight and dress in light-colored or reflective clothing, and cross the street only at intersections that are well lit. Please watch your step. By looking out for each other, we can all get home safely. As the weather gets nicer and it's much uh, better to go for a jog, go for a walk after work, it, it's critically important that you pay attention, especially in these low light conditions. You don't want to become a fatality. Make sure that you're paying attention to your surroundings. A lot of people like to travel or walk with their music in their ears. I strongly suggest you keep the volume down or you can keep one of the headphones, one of the earbuds out so you can hear oncoming traffic. You can hear warning horns or, or other uh, approaching danger. Whenever you're a pedestrian on the road, always walk facing traffic. You always want to be able to see that oncoming car and be able to react if it doesn't see you. You should always be visible. Wear highly reflective bright clothing, carry a flashlight, do things to make yourself conspicuous. This is a pedestrian with no reflective clothing and you can see that the ability of the driver to see that pedestrian is greatly reduced in dark and dim light conditions. Now with lights on and reflective gear, you can see that the perception of the driver to the pedestrian is greatly enhanced. A flashlight carried in your hand that allows a driver to see you. A $10 vest is a little price to pay from a serious injury. One of the biggest safety features that we have in Henrico County is where a sidewalk is available. We do encourage pedestrians to use that sidewalk. Henrico County is investing an enormous amount of money right now on building sidewalks, building crosswalks, adding bicycle facilities so that we can accommodate the ever-growing demand for our residents to use alternative means of transportation to be able to get some exercise in the evening and do so safely. We're going to go ahead now and introduce some speakers, but before I do that, if you are watching us on, on YouTube, uh, on the, the right side of your screen, you can type in questions as you want to, and, and when your concern comes up, go ahead and type it in. Uh, if you do not have access to that and you haven't, um, you, you aren't able to use that function, you can email me, and I will get it, uh, pob at patobannon.com. Okay, so I'll hold on to that. Now for those, uh, now we're going to begin your discussions here, but first we have Mike Jennings, and he is the Assistant Director of Public Works. 
and I've worked with Mr. Jennings for many years, and he's very knowledgeable about this. And if you do have, um, after he gives his information, if you have a question about the safety of a road or you have a road that you have concerns about, because I know, as I said, I got a uh, one email that I think he's going to answer or work with that. Uh, once he's talked about uh, the traffic signalization and sidewalks and crosswalks. And then we have Captain Don Lambert, who's the Special Operations Group for Henrico County Police. Um, he's going to talk about, um, again, traffic safety for drivers. So, Mr. Jennings, if you'll start us off. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. O'Bannon. Right. As Ms. O'Bannon said, I'm Mike Jennings. I'm an assistant director with the Department of Public Works. Um, several topics have come up uh, that, that she asked me to speak about, about safety, and, uh, some, some intersections in particular. Um, basically, I'm going to give a little bit of background about traffic in general, um, traffic circles, roundabouts, a little bit of differences in how you use them. Talk about the Perrin-Patterson intersection. I know that's always come up. River Road intersection, Church Road, some questions. Um, Param and the I-64 intersection. But we'll talk about that. And talk about one of the topics is posted speed limits. How do we post them and why? What we can, where we can go from there. Of course, what Coban has been speaking mainly about, a big topic is pedestrians, uh, cyclists, safety. And I'm going to talk, touch a little bit on road maintenance and uh, potholes, of course, that you run into while you're out there traveling. So um, our traffic engineering department, uh, so Henrico County is one of two counties in the state of Virginia that maintain, maintains its own secondary road system. What that means is, is that Henrico County is responsible for all the subdivision and secondary streets in the county. Basically, we maintain 3,532 lane miles of roadway. Now, the rest of the roadways in the county are primaries, such as Patterson Avenue, which is State Route 6, or something like West Broad Street, which is State Route 250, and all the interstates, those are maintained by VDOT, or the Virginia Department of Transportation. So part of maintaining the roads is our traffic engineering department. Uh, makes up, we have 35 employees that are responsible to maintain the traffic engineering portions of our road. What that means is the signals, as you see above, which there's over about 155 signals we maintain. Uh, we do the lane striping, where you can see the edge lines and the white skip lines in there. Obviously, you see a sign there that needs maintenance because it's been knocked over. Um, we, we do all the regulatory signs, like you see the speed limit sign there. Also, at the sign on the bottom, you see um, speeding to an additional fine. That's actually part of our, part of our traffic calming program, which is part of, uh, we have a program that the board approved uh, back in 2004 with, to help with the uh, any speeding concerns in neighborhoods. So that's one of the phases in that. So um, traffic circles um, and roundabouts. The reason I have it, traffic circle versus V roundabout, is the fact that the traffic circles that we used to see, um, like on the left up there, that's actually the one at the monument where the Jeb Stewart Memorial uh, statue is. That's not the roundabouts that we're proposing in Henrico County. These, as you see, are a lar large footprint. A lot of, you see the traffic patterns all different directions. They have trouble controlling the speeds through the intersection. They have um, their stop control. Well, this one's actually signal controlled. A lot of them are stop controlled. Um, and, or, or there's the old type that, as you see on the right, that is in a neighborhood setting it more is a traffic impedance or a little, you know, more of a hassle than anything that people still speed around it. It doesn't do the job that we wanted to do. Our media services department is working on a video to, uh, about how to use roundabouts, the benefits of roundabouts. But in the meantime, I would like to show a video, Lori's going to help me with this, um, that Missouri D Department of Transportation uh, put together which is very informative on benefits and how to use them. Intersections across Missouri are changing to give motorists a safe, clog-free drive while saving taxpayer money, too. These circular intersections are called roundabouts, and they're designed to safely get a lot of traffic through an intersection without much waiting. 
Let's start with how a roundabout is different from a traditional traffic signal intersection. Instead of red, yellow, and green lights for drivers to follow, a roundabout is a one-way circle of traffic with yield signs at each entry point. An entry point is where a driver will yield into a roundabout, which allows flowing traffic with little to no stopping. They're easy to navigate through and more importantly, safer to use than traditional traffic signal intersections. A study by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety says, Roundabouts reduce collisions of all types by 39%, injury collisions by 76%, with fatal and incapacitating collisions down by 89%. Pedestrians are safer too. People are 50% less likely to get hit at a roundabout than at a common signalized crosswalk. Reasons for these safety improvements for both motorists and pedestrians include slower traffic speeds, smaller collision angles, and fewer conflict points. For example, a typical intersection has 20 to 30 conflict points or spots where vehicles could collide. Roundabouts reduce this number to eight. <music> Using a roundabout is simple, and so let's get through one together. When approaching a roundabout, you will see a dashed white line and a yield sign at each entry point. Slow down, signal, look for oncoming cars, pedestrians, and bicyclists, and then when you see a safe opening for you and your car, proceed into the roundabout. Just follow the circle of traffic until you see the road you want to continue on and then exit, which will remove you from the roundabout. It's important to know that all roundabouts work the same, but they may not look the same. Some offer single lane traffic, while others may have two lanes for drivers. Also, most roundabouts are designed with a truck apron to accommodate large vehicles like school buses, semi-trucks, or farm equipment. This raised section of pavement around the central island is the truck apron. This allows for the back wheels of an oversized truck to ride up as they circle around, which helps these bigger vehicles maneuver through. Remember, give drivers of these oversized vehicles a little extra room. A handful of roundabouts may be shaped into more of an oval than a circle, and the number of entry and exit points may vary as well. Again, despite a number of different looks, how you navigate through a roundabout never changes. Another great advantage is cost. Roundabouts are less expensive to maintain than traffic signal intersections, and don't include operating expenses or utility fees like most traffic lights do. Roundabouts are more green than signalized intersections. Vehicles don't stop and idle as much, so there is a reduction of emissions into the environment. Plus, a landscape circle is more attractive than metal poles and traffic signals hanging in the sky. So we also like to think that roundabouts are better looking than traditional intersections as well. More and more of these roundabouts will be replacing traffic signal intersections, but this shouldn't scare you. Using a roundabout is easy, plus they save us time and money while keeping us safer too. All right, thank you, Victoria. All right, so we, what we've proposed so far in the county um, is our only single lane roundabout. But just so you know, currently on public street intersections, we only have one roundabout in the county, and that's actually in a, in inside of a neighborhood over off Knuckles Road at the intersection of Opaca Lane and West Place. But uh, so that one's not a large one, and you know, may or may not have gone through. But, uh, Right now, we currently have um, several proposed with projects we're working on. One, uh, y'all remember, you'll probably remember the North Gaten Road extension north of Broad Street. Where it, where it crosses I-64, we're looking at getting an intersection approved with I-64. One of the, a couple of the options that we are working on getting approval from federal highways is, um, that does include roundabouts on that. 
Um, also, our Sadler Road Improvement Project, we have two roundabouts included with that project, one at Ends Lake uh, Drive and one up at Sadler Place. And also our Woodman Road Extended Project, which is currently underway partially by the county and partially by the developer of River Mill Development up there. There's going to be a roundabout, the roundabout's going to be at Woodman and Greenwood Road. So um, one of the big intersections, obviously, the Burn and Tuckahoe District, and for years with congestion is a Perrin Patterson intersection. Um, that's one that we've been working with VDOT for years, and they actually have a project moving forward with that project to improve uh, intersection capacity, signal improvements, some crosswalks, some uh, other pedestri pedestrian heads, and looking at left turn, double left turn lanes instead of single left turn lanes, right turn lanes where it's available. Um, they are currently in right-of-way acquisition with that project right now. They've acquired about half of the 31 projects ne uh, parcels necessary to complete that project. Um, they expect to be uh, done with that by the end of this year. Then it will be in re utility relocation, and that's expected to take about a year for utility relocation, and then they'll advertise for bid. Um, they're ad advertised expected day or advertised for construction, excuse me. Advertised for construction is expected in November of 2020. VDOT thinks that they'll be able to beat that. Um, hopefully they will. Um, so if it's advertised before then, construction could begin towards the end of 2020. If it's not advertised in November of 2020, construction will start till 2021. But that is, we're looking forward to that project to keep moving forward. Uh, another intersection that um, some questions have come up is actually an interesting one. The River Road intersection the three legs of the intersection are actually maintained by three different entities. We've got from the north or the upper upper quadrant is our port is the county's portion of River Road. The portion headed towards the uh, towards the east um, is actually considered the uh, city of Richmond, and the portion heading to the west across the Huguenot Bridge is maintained by VDOT. Um, VDOT just did some improvements at that intersection. Um, they did some signal improvements added some crosswalks, push buttons, and a little bit of sidewalk. And they're also currently working on a gamble, it's called Gambles Mill Trail Project, which will take off from that project, go up towards Three Chop Road. It'll be a big shared use path for pedestrians and bicycles. To use. Um, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't know if I should say that or not, but Ms. O'Bannon really pushed that project. <laughs> so... Um, and obviously, this is one of those intersections that's, I uh, wouldn't say tricky, but, it, you know, we've got two lanes going. That it, there's a lot of merging and weaving situations. So please remember to drive carefully and, you know, pay attention to signage out there. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to put a plug in for this. This was a project that came forward because that, you remember the, the nice young woman that was using riding her bicycle where you see the right side there going east, Up River Road, um, um, Lanny Krzyzewski. And um, we immediately at the Richmond Regional Transportation Authority, Metropolitan Transportation Authority, uh, wanted to move on that. I very quickly um, got together with the city of Richmond, VDOT, and Henrico, and we moved forward with a project to put in the signalization and the crosswalks. It was $950,000 just to do those improvements. But it got us to the edge of the University of Richmond's road there, Gambles Mill Road, which is now closed, and you really can't go down it. So I went to visit the, um, the president of Uni University of Richmond, and they agreed that they would work on it, but then uh, Ed Ayers was then the president, and he retired. So we had to wait just a little while. Um, uh, Dr. Crutcher uh, is now the president at the University of Richmond, and this summer the students are going to be working on that project, which is down Gambles Mill Road. I believe you can see the road or the edge of the road. I, don't, I think it's the first one right there. Uh, it was formerly a road where the University of Richmond would get um, would get coal for their coal-fired plant. The coal would come in in that area. But Gambles Mill is now going to be a very nicely landscaped and, landscaped and bicycle byway, walkway and byway for the public 
so that they can go up and reach um, a, a, a better or safer way of getting into town through Grove Avenue. So that project right there um, has taken several years, but it was really just because the University of Richmond president retired. But we're very pleased with that. But I, I joke that it only took me about a year and a half to get my part of the project done. In, in the, and, I, and I had bet Dr. A. He said, it'll take you three or four years. <laughs> but it took like less than two years. And then I went to him and said, okay, I'm done, it's your turn. And he said, oh, I'm retiring. <laughs> but Dr. Crutcher picked right up where Dr. Ayers left out, left off, and that will be probably completed in this fall. So we're really happy about that for the bicyclists and bicycle safety. Ms. O'Bannon. Another concern, another road that was brought to our attention before this meeting Turns the church road right through here, and there's that sharp turn up before you get to free chop. Um, Public Works is currently evaluating that road for some safety improvements. Um, you know, at this point, please remember to drive the posted speed limit and look, pay attention to any curve advisory plates. We are looking to provide some safety improvements. That's one of those that's uh, only most of it's 24 foot. Um, with not much of a shoulder and ditch, so we'll, we'll work on something we can see we can do to improve that road. Intersection of Parham and I-64. We currently are working with the Richmond Regional Transportation Planning Organization for a study of this area. What the study is going to include is not only this this intersection, which we consider the I-64. Parham intersection, but also the Malin intersection and all the weaving movements in between. You all know how congested and confusing that can get. One of those that technically, so VDOT technically is, um, this is part of their maintenance, their, uh, their, their, their limited access stops there. So we're working with them on a study. Um, we're looking for safety improvements to that area. Um, and then, then after that, we'll look at some funding sources, implement those recommended changes. We expect to have the results of the study by the end of this year. So a uh, big topic that I've uh, been asked about is posted speed limits. Where do they come from? How do you, what, do you use, what criteria do you use to, to uh, post the speed limit? Um, a lot of it has to deal with, at the very beginning, beginning design stage of the project, uh, you look at the road classification. What that means is um, the county has a, a major thoroughfare plan that projects um, land uses in the future, land uses current, it and we also project traffic expected because of the, the land use plan. We have classifications. Of course, we have our subdivision streets, and but we also have what we call our collector road system and above, which we have minor collectors, major collectors, minor arterials and major arterials, depending on the amount of traffic that the road's expected to handle. So by looking at the classifications and the traffic volumes along the roadway, you look at the geometry of the roadway. What that means is um, designing it with the horizontal and vertical curves for a certain posted speed limit. And the site, so site distance with any intersections along that road need to be safe to post that speed limit. So a lot of questions recently in Mrs. O'Bannon's district is uh, Parham Road, uh, why is it 45? That's one that is technically classified as a major arterial route on the county's major thoroughfare plan. That roadway handles anywhere between 20,000 to 45,000 vehicles per day, depending on the section you're on. Um, so it, like, being a larger road, um, when it was originally designed years ago, it was expected to handle a large amount of traffic. It was designed horizontal and vertical curves um, with um, and in sight distances to be posted 45 miles an hour. So, and through the years, with more congestion and different things going on, we, we evaluate posted speed limits along roads all the time. So we've been changed posted speed limits. We're currently re reviewing part of Parent Road, <coughs> excuse me, to see if it ju justifies lowering speed limit. But that's how Parham, Parham Road was posted at 45 from the beginning. A major corridor expected to handle to move a lot of traffic. So, um, pedestrian cyclist safety, which is a, a big part of this meeting. Uh, I know uh, 
Captain Lambert's going to speak on some of the things that we're doing to help with that. But um, Ms. O'Bannon spoke of all the uh, projects that we're working on sidewalk-wise and stuff like that. But I just wanted to mention a couple things. Um, currently in the county, we have 260 miles of sidewalk. And we actually have 20 miles of, additional miles of sidewalk programmed to be constructed within the next two years. We're trying to be very proactive in adding sidewalk. Mrs. O'Bannon hit on something that I don't need to talk about, is the fact that in the past, the county was not pro-sidewalk. A lot of these current, the previous projects weren't required to put it on. But now, the county is working on adding projects as funding sources are available, add sidewalk along our existing roads, and when developers come in, we're getting them to add sidewalk for their project. Um, this actually, the upper left, is a sidewalk we just recently added along John Rolfe Parkway. Uh, the lower right is with our North Gate and Road project. And on that case, instead of adding a sidewalk, we added a shared use path on one side. So that, that's another option that sometimes our developers prefer to do. So, and then another thing that we've been looking at doing recently is uh, what we call lane diets. That is where you restripe a road to a different configuration. This is one off Knuckles Road, Twin Hickory. That what we realized, the upper left picture, the four-lane undivided roadway. And based on our major thoroughfare plan and expected traffic years ago, we built that to a four-lane undivided highway. Well, based on current traffic volumes, four lanes weren't needed. But we also had a lot of pedestrian and bike traffic along those roads. So you see the sidewalk, the sidewalk down the lower right, the sidewalk was already existing on one side, which was good, but there was really not a good place for bicyclists along the road. So what we did in this case, as you see in the lower right, it was restriped with bike lanes on each side, a little buffer for a safety area, and then one lane in each direction. And then the yellow, um, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with the, it's called a two-way left turn lane um, in the middle. So at the intersections with neighborhoods or businesses along there, they still get in the left turn lane to turn left and not, be, not cause, not stopping in the through lane and block traffic while, uh, you know, waiting to turn left at, at times. So that's some, some, one of the things we've been looking at, lane diets around the county. This is just one we recently implemented. So when it comes to road maintenance, um, part of uh, what y'all, where y'all drive on a daily basis, those 3,552 or 32 lane miles that we maintain, um, we're responsible for repaving them when necessary. We repave approximately 150 miles of pavement per year. That includes subdivisions and some of our larger streets. We um, obviously um, we, we take requests, but we look at we evaluate the conditions of the roads and, and program them every year. One of the things that we hadn't done in the past, but we're going to work on doing, is putting our paving paving expected. I'm caveat this is expected paving schedule online so the public can see it so they can see whether their roads expect to be paved that year. And the reason I say expected, obviously there's going to be a caveat. We all know with weather permitting, um, other issues that come up with even equipment, um, stuff like that, and, um, and other requests or issues that may pop up in the meantime, sometimes we may not be able to get to them that year, but then they'll be programmed for the next year if necessary. But we're going to put an expected paving schedule online. So, you know, the other thing is, you know, we've got 140 employees in our uh, road maintenance department, and they're not just responsible for the paving of our roads. They've got to do drainage complaints along the, in the right of way. They've got to do litter pickup, leaf vacuuming, and, um, you know, among other things. So, um, but we will, we do, on an average, pave about 150 miles of, of, road, of roadway per year. The other thing, obviously, unfortunately, it comes up, potholes. Um, we, um, this past year, we fixed about 11,000 potholes. So, unfortunately, with uh, the, the roads with a little bit of cracking, sometimes water gets in there, freeze thaw happens, and next thing you know, with a lot of traffic, portions of it pop out. So, um, one of the things that I'd like to I put up here is um, y'all all live in the western part of Henrico or served by our West End Road Maintenance Department. Um, obviously, we fix potholes if we see them. But sometimes we don't know they're there. We appreciate the residents making us aware of potholes. Um, Y'all can call 727-8300, our West End Road Maintenance Department, to report a pothole. We can come out and fix it, as you see below. Um, or other, and also online on our uh, county website, there's available to re you're available to report a pothole. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Sure, if you'd like to. One of the things that I got the county to do recently was to have an app, a county app. If you have an iPhone or an Android, you can go to the app store and download it. And when I touch Henrico's app, and I type in a search for pothole, that's what comes up. The phone number and access here if you want to type it in. So if you have an iPhone or an Android, you can download the app and make it even faster. You don't have to start up your laptop or computer and, and do it. So there you go. If you're out in your car, don't do it while you're driving. <laughs> have your passenger do it. Yes, or you will be talking to Cam Ca Captain Lambert over here. So, <laughs> um, yeah, obviously he's some of the things I touched on. He's going to further look in, talk about with pedestrian safety, bike safety, what we're what we're working on as a group, what the police department's doing. Um, do you have any questions at this point? Yes, ma'am. Striping roadway yes ma'am that's part of our traffic engineering division okay if I could take this opportunity to hear an observation especially on these wonderful double left turn arrows yes ma'am what I notice is there are not corresponding striping always on the roadway and if I'm on the inside turning left People on the outside turning left sometimes crowd me, or vice versa. If I'm on the outside turning left, the person on the inside turning left, say, onto Broad Street, wants to be in the middle lane where I am, and they're just going to come right over because there's no striping on the road to help guide them. At least I hope it would help guide them. <laughs> And the same, that happens at the intersection of West End Drive and West Broad, as well as, what is it, Glenside and Forest, where they have a double turn left. So that's just, you know, a, a please paint the road. <laughs> uh, yes, ma'am. We, we do you. try to paint, which we, we jokingly call puppy feet because there's smaller skip lines to the intersection. Yeah, that's what we call them. Um, do the help guide tra cars through an intersection. Some of the ones you mentioned are VDOT. We work with them to put puppy feet through their intersections. But we do work with that. Unfortunately, sometimes they get worn off. And then, as we all know, it is a guide. Some people crowd it anyway. But uh, we'll work on making sure we can have guide the proper, proper guidance through an intersection. <laughs> sometimes that works. No. Since you're already doing a road study program at Parham and I-64, you know, the Tucker High School is going to be rebuilt and reopened in fall of 2021 with increased capacity, and my guess would be some of the allocation of that land will change as well. Are you all expanding the study, since it's adjacent to your current study, are you all going to expand the study to include safe traffic patterns for our students? That's a very good question. I'm glad you asked because it actually leads into a couple projects that Public Works does have currently is adding additional sidewalk in that area. Also, in combination of that school being rebuilt, um, Public Works is working at, for improvements at the intersection. We're going to put a traffic signal at that intersection of Homeview and Parham, uh, pedestrian crossings, and sidewalk in that area. So um, more than likely um, with the school... The school uh, project, we're going to put in temporary signals at the intersection, but then make them permanent once we move forward with our project. You're welcome. I'm Becky Crow. I have to say one caveat. I actually work for the Federal Highway Administration, um, but I live in Henrico. And I want to thank you, Ms. Bannon, because I think you do a fabulous job. You're probably one of the most progressive board members we have in terms of highway safety. Um, <laughs> I mean, you're always trying to move us. Really appreciate it, and I also appreciate um, the Department of Public Works. But I did want to put a plug in for road diets. Um, I am an expert in this area, um, and I ride around in Rico all the time. I've I've talked to quite a bit. Um, we have a lot of 
um, have a lot of overcapacity on our roadways. Um, that's why we have a big because roads are so wide and, and go way past the limit. I know you see it all the time. Um, so I just want to encourage you all to continue with road diets. Um, you know, if, if the road is under 20,000 vehicles a day, it's and we have a lot of those roads. And you can improve it for bus. Um, a lot of times, if you just, just give that extra space on the roadway where there's no sidewalk, it's somewhere to um, traffic. So just a little plug, but thank you so much, our Thank you, Ms. Crow. Um, that actually leads, I mean, I'll, I'll speak about something else since you brought that up. We are analyzing the roads we have for additional lane diets. Um, we like to get, we have community meetings, get their input, stuff like that. Um, one of the things you hit on is uh, very, very um, ties into with Ms. O'Banis at the very beginning. About 20 years ago, people didn't want, folks didn't want sidewalks in front of their house. Sometimes we'd hear it would bring a bad element in front of my house, but anyway. So, um, with that said, 20 years ago, and the mentality, not should say mentality, the thinking of public works, and it was to move traffic, as much traffic as possible. And that's why you see some of these wide roads, um, which causes, is, is causing us problems nowadays. Um, one of the things we designed our subdivision streets, 36 foot wide. See her expression when I said that. So, <laughs> yeah, so... The thought was you have parking on each side and 24 feet of tra two-way traffic. How many people park in the street these days? Not many. Um, with that, so, we're, so the other thing is we had standards that were larger. I, mi I mentioned vertical and horizontal curves. Uh, in neighborhoods, we had a minimum of 300-foot vertical cur or horizontal curve. That's not tight to slow down traffic. One of the things Public Works is currently working on is updating our standard. Um, I hope to get it to the board soon. But um, if we're going to narrow the roads, we're going to tighten up our curves, horizontal and vertical curves, to help slow down traffic. And, but obviously that will apply to new construction. On existing streets, we're looking at the lane diets, as she mentioned, and also maybe some bump outs or something to help slow down traffic. Because like, like Ms. O'Bannon and I have been, spoke about earlier, and the fact that we designed the streets not for pedestrians and bicyclists in the past. It was to move traffic as much traffic as we could. And obviously, with the way things have changed through the years and the needs of our citizens, um, that, that's changed. So we have to look at things differently. But thank you. Hi, my name is Jacob Thornton. Thanks for being here today and taking questions. I live in the Tuckahoe area. You mentioned the Pear and Patterson intersection improvements that are coming. You also mentioned traffic calming. I have a quick question. I am on one of the streets that serves as a cut through for people that are trying to avoid Pear and Patterson <coughs> intersection. Uh, the, the county did a speed study for us recently, and two of our streets fell less than a mile an hour under the threshold for, for the next level. Um, but there seems to be no consideration for volume. One of the issues in my neighborhood is just sheer volume of cars that are coming through. Not necessarily that they're all flying through, but there's just a ton of traffic on the neighborhood street. Is there, is there any consideration for how to handle that? Yeah, we, we look at that, but a lot of times um, so, so we expect on the average 10 vehicle trips per day per household. Um, a lot of people, when, a lot of folks, once we give them that information that we expect that much traffic, sometimes it seems higher than normal. Sometimes um, there's distribution of traffic in the neighborhood that could be affected by cause more traffic, and it's not really cut through as such, but they need to use a road. But we do take that into consideration if it's an obvious cut through, get from Parham over to three or oh, Parham over to Patterson. I can we can look at that again. I don't I don't know off the top of my head the results from your study, but it's something we can look at. And we are looking at, at tweaking our traffic calling program also. Follow up on his comment. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, in our traffic calling program, we basically have a two phase traffic calling program. 
The first phase would be first phase would be the installation of the signs that I said, the 200 additional fine for speeding. After that, we let it go six to eight months, see how things are going, restudy it. If there's still a problem on the street, the next phase would be the installation of speed home. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. That, yes, ma'am, that is part of our traffic calming program. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I can talk. Oh, <laughs> there's Mr. Ross. No. I think I hit on some of the some of the things you talked about. I did mention. I did forget a few. Um, one of the questions. I, obviously, I didn't go look at my notes at all. So, um, one of the things that was brought to our or asked before our meeting was, um, you know, we maintain our own roads, our secondary roads. Like I said, we're one of two counties in the state that do that. Um, they, Mr. Ross asked, what are the pluses and minuses of that? Hope from y'all's perspective, that's a plus because I think we do a pretty good job. I don't know how many times we hear. When it comes to snow or paving, how much better we are than other places around us. I'll just leave it at that. So, um, you know, so I think that's a plus. Um, basically, what the state does is through taxes of a uh, gas tax, they give us an allocation for the amount of lane miles that we maintain. Uh, right now, it's right at $13,600 per lane mile. That's basically $49 million per year that we get um, for, to maintain our roadways. Um, with that, and we try to pave as many projects as we can. Also, maintenance of our roadways does include some of the, the drainage work that we have to do, replacing bridges, culverts, stuff like that. So we can't just have to spend $49 million on just paving. So, um, but we do use that for that. So I think we try to, out, to use our funds and take care of our roads as, as well as we can. Um, you know, obviously, that does mean that, that, that we take pride in that. Um, we don't have to wait for VDOT schedules to pave our roads in the county. That could be good, could be bad, you never know. So um, they have their state needs that they look at. So, um, and also it, it does take consideration that, you know, I've got, we've got 140 employees in our road maintenance department that need to take care of these roads and monitor these paving, prep work before we, there's a lot of prep work involved before we pave sometimes. Um, and then the fact that, um, but we are fortunate. The board has approved some con contractors to help us out with some of the paving, some of the other work, like the vacuum and stuff like that. So I think that's a plus. Is there any, I don't think if there's any other topics. Uh, Mr. Ross, is there anything? <laughs> All right, wait one second. It's supposed to be recorded. <laughs> I, I asked the question because I, I, I do like to ride a lot, and I, I have a road bike, so I'm, some of these spots I hit pretty high speeds. <clears throat> and I've hit a pothole before on a mountain bike just going three miles an hour, standing up, looking around to see which trail I'm going to get on, and flipped over the handlebars. So <clears throat> I imagine if I hit a pothole at about 30 miles an hour, how catastrophic that would be. Now I'm saying our, our roads are better than the city of Richmond. I will say that. <laughs> okay. They've had their own uh, problems. But the more I've seen, and I think I alluded this email our pace of development has, has always been really good in this county, and we've always uh, been about smart growth and so forth. But I would like to see, uh, as we have more pedestrians, more riders, people looking at their cell phones while they're crossing the street, that's a whole different matter. But as, as And driving, yes. But as that increases, I do like what I'm hearing, uh, uh, narrower roadways, um, a more of an emphasis on safety. I like to see greener medians as opposed to concrete or asphalt, but also uh, as we, our neighborhoods and so forth get denser, that we make it better for riders and walkers. So I, I do like what, I, what I'm seeing with that, but I would like to see, I know we had a rainy uh, spring and, and also last year, so the paving schedule was probably severely disrupted for for everybody, but I'd like to see more of the potholes maintained. It, it, it seems like it's, it's we need to catch up a little bit in that area. And I just see things too, like when I when I ride, because I'll, I'll have to swerve. And when you're swerving very quickly, you might a, a motorist might think, "What is what is that dude doing swerving right in front of me?" But I'm trying to dodge a pothole because I'm, I'm, and so I've just had to keep my eyes open for that a little bit more. 
Whereas in the past, and Ryko's done a really good job maintaining. Um, but I know that hopefully that'll be fixed because we've had a lot of rain, like I said, in the past. So that's just one of the things I think we need to be aware of. And I like the, the tool with, with the app. Um, and for those that are directionally challenged, how does the app work? Like you'd have to point out the, the, uh, the street intersection or is it all done by GPS? Like you could stand over the pothole and say, here I am. And no, I, I unfortunately have not used that app yet. <laughs> Kind of like how you do on Waze or something like that, where you drive over the spot. I'm not sure you can drop that, but what I what I said was, when you open the app, at the yeah. top it says search, and I was just searching pothole. Yeah. And you would have to say I'm near, I'm I'm east of the intersection of this. I'm mean, you know the. Yeah. Or describe what road you're on. Yeah. First, okay. I'm on the hundred nine hundred block of Forest. Yeah. You know. And there's a pothole that I almost hit in front of 709 or something like that. Right. And that The phone number is in there, which, of course, you'd want to get off your bike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and call the number and tell them, because otherwise it does go to the, the website that you saw. But I would, yeah. I would call, because that's yeah. usually the best way to get them. Oh, opinion. but the, the, also the trail by University of Richmond is really great, because I ride yeah. through there quite a bit if I'm on my way to the city. And so that gives me a chance now to uh, have a better ride through there, and then catch yeah. the Huguenot Bridge. Great, that bike lane. Well, if there, you so. see the Huguenot Bridge, it's it's only two lanes and it's very wide. Right. Uh, again, that was one of the features that the people who lived there at the Huguenot Bridge wanted, and I worked very hard for that. It is not a four-lane bridge; it's two very wide lanes. You also see sidewalks on either side of the bridge. That's another that was another thing that the people said they wanted. I worked hard for that. Uh, there are no lights on the bridge currently. That was something the people said they didn't want. And when VDOT came to me and said, we want to close the road that goes, um, for, uh, the, the road that's down toward the river as your, your West Ham, West, no, West Ham, isn't it? West, no, it's um, West Ham Station. West Ham Station Road, we want to close right. it. And the firefighters said, oh, don't do that because otherwise we have to go up and down hills in the snow. We need the flat surface, and we need to access that area quickly with their fire trucks. So I said, no, don't close West Ham Station Road. And they said, well, then we're going to have to take the lights off the bridge. Go oh, great. <laughs> Nobody wanted lights. However, now um, VDOT is going to put, they're going to put lights on the bridge. They are now installing them because when I told them, I said, if you're going to remove lights on the bridge, just be sure you put in the electrical, con electrical conduits or the wiring. They did, and they are now planning to add the light. I'm not sure how that's going to go over because everybody said we don't want lights. I mean, this I, I follow what people tell me to do, but that was the other thing. The bridge was built to as close as we could get to being safe, having space for bicyclists, walkers, which we see every day, all the time. I see them coming from south side. I see ladies pushing baby carriages, and they, they go to Starbucks. I thought, wow. <laughs> but exactly, trying very hard to maintain some space there, and when going up the hill is not safe any time of day. So by turning and going through the University of Richmond, if, if you're a cyclist or a walker, you can get over to where it is striped for cyclists on uh, Grove Avenue. That was the intent, was to move cyclists right. that way to a safer roadway. So that was part of that whole project. It should be finished in the fall. But no, if you have to get off your bike and type it in, that would be the thing to okay. do. Right there. Good afternoon. I'm Don Lambert. I am uh, nursing a little cold, so I may stop to get some water because I've got a scratchy throat. Um, I want to summarize a couple of points that Mr. Jennings made so that you understand the enormity of this because I've been involved in traffic safety for about half a year. And some of these things are just now coming to make a point in my head. 
Mr. Bannon said $750 per sidewalk foot. Quickly broke out my calculator, and that's $3.9 million per mile. Now, it doesn't cost quite that much, I don't believe, for a sidewalk, but it's in the millions for a mile of sidewalk. I say that to say that Mr. Jennings talked about their allocation for VDOT being $49 million a year. That's less than 50 miles of sidewalk. And that's just for the sidewalk. That doesn't fix anything else in the county. So let me, I just wanted to point that out. Not my lane, but I just wanted to say that. So um, I have been asked to speak about four topics. I'm probably going to talk about five. Um, and the first one is what to do at yellow flashing arrows. So the one that comes to my mind right off the jump is at West End and Hungry Road. Yeah. And, and I actually love that. So here's the purpose behind that. VDOT and Public Works, um, depending on who owns the signal, has been starting to phase those in. The idea being that it makes traffic quicker. So that's why they're there. Because in, in the older days and at older intersections, you'll come up to make a left turn and you see a green ball. And a lot of drivers don't know what to do with that. Do I yield? Do I not? A lot of them think that means I can go. I have a green light. I can go. And then they pull out in front of somebody and get hit. And that's bad. So um, instead, this yellow flashing arrow puts you to mind that you need to pay attention. Be cautious. If it's clear, you can go. If it's not, you can't. And the idea is to move traffic quicker through the intersection. While I'm on that topic, I live near the intersection of Woodman and Greenwood Road, and I am extremely excited about our roundabout, and I'm going to tell you why because I come to work about school opening time for Greenwood Elementary School. And for those of you that live near a school, you know what traffic is like. Um, and I have to sit to wait to turn onto Woodman Road for sometimes as long as five minutes. Um, not a big deal. Driving a county car on county time, it's okay. However, it can be frustrating at times. And that happens in the afternoon at school dismissal time and in the morning at school opening time. With a roundabout, we're going to cut some of that out so that traffic can more feel, freely flow sections. Very excited about that. Any questions on the yellow flashing arrows? I, I'd like to believe that they're pretty self-explanatory. And you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I figured them out. So I, I think you guys should too. All right. Um, second is traffic infractions. And I'm going to include with that traffic complaints. So I'm not exactly sure what I need to say about traffic infractions, except to point out that um, in Virginia, crimes are classified in different ways. Um, so there are felonies and misdemeanors, um, and traffic infractions are just that. They're infractions, depending on what the violation is. For example, DUI is a Class 1 misdemeanor. It does mean you can get up to a year in jail, up to a $2,500 fine, some other bad things that happen to you, so don't drive drunk. Okay? But... Um, speeding is a traffic infraction, depending on your speed. You are more than 20 miles an hour over the speed limit is reckless driving, which is a class one misdemeanor, up to 12 months in jail, $500 fine. Traffic complaints. Um, we, my section, handle traffic complaints and traffic safety. We get a large number of complaints from you guys, not you specifically, but you guys. Um, when you were talking about your area, it was Glendale, Henrico Avenue, any of that, I know. Okay, I was, I was on our traffic crash team from 1995 to 2001. I used to run radar on Henrico and Glendale back then. Um, we still are. And some of these cut through areas, and, and I get exactly what you're saying. It's very frustrating if you live in that area. Um, and we go back. Some of these places are places we could run radar there every day, put a cop there every day and run radar, and he'd write tickets every day. However, I only have so many people, I've got a lot of traffic complaints to handle. So with that, we do the best that we can to try to manage that. We have a traffic complaint hotline. If you look on our webpage, henrico.us, uh, and find decision on there, we'll find a place that uh, gives you the number that you can call in traffic complaints. Um, I will give you my email address which is lam02 at henrico.us, lam02 at henrico.us. You can send them to me. I get a few of them. Um, I realize I'm opening myself up for that, but that's okay. get a lot of them. Um, and what we will do is 
depending on what the complaint is, what, what the issue is, we will handle it in one of several different ways. We don't always initially send a police officer out to run radar when you call in a speeding complaint. We get a fair number of complaints where people will say some of the things like similar to what you said. I live in a residential neighborhood and people are going 900 miles an hour down here like a rocket ship. Okay. If it's an area where in our common sense and historical observation and personal experience we've really not seen that before, then we have some devices that we can put out um, different from the traffic counters that DPW uses that allow us to remotely monitor feeds over whatever period of time we put the device out there. Um, usually leave that device out for three or four days and it records the speed of every car that comes through there, every vehicle that comes through there. And then based on the results of that, we can make a decision as to whether we want to do enforcement or not. But the bigger thing that that does for us is we can go back to the citizen that made the complaint and say, hey, here's what we're seeing. And I know it looks to you like everybody's doing a thousand miles an hour, they're not. So, and a, another problem that we have relative to that is occasionally, doesn't happen a lot, but we'll have that complaint, just like I just described, come in, and it's um, one fine citizen that lives in your neighborhood who refuses to drive like a rational human being. And in situations like that, we try to address that the rifle instead of a shotgun, that being that we go talk to them and ask them to knock it off. Um, use a lot more polite verbiage than that, but that's basically what we're trying to do. Um, because it's not everybody in the neighborhood, it's one or two people. Nevertheless, we'll look into all of that. So, as I said, we get a fair number of complaints from folks in the Tucko District, and I understand that. I understand the volume of traffic at Paramount Patterson. It has been an issue um, in terms of volume and how to, what's the best thing to do with that intersection for almost my entire 32-year career. So it's, it's a difficult thing to handle, and I'm glad that VDOT is looking at that. Um, but what solution will come of that, I really don't know. Any questions on traffic complaints or traffic infractions? Okay, distracted driving. I'm going to talk about distracted stuff rather than driving, uh, well, rather than singling out to driving. Um, as Ms. O'Bannon kind of joked with you about distracted biking. Um, so when it comes to pedestrian safety, when it comes to driving, when it comes to all the rest of that, we want our folks not to be distracted while they're doing what they're doing. We have had, and I'm kind of getting into my next topic, um, increasing number of pedestrian fatalities over the last few years in Henrico County, and that's actually a trend that's been going on nationwide. Um, they're seeing the same thing happen. Reasons that right now are not easily explained. We can't say that there's more people walking, although that's what we feel like it might be. More cars on the road, we can't prove that, but that's what we think it might be. Um, the bigger point to me is that people, everybody's in a hurry. Everybody's in a hurry. And everybody's time is more important than yours. So if it's a pedestrian, they won't cross at crosswalks or at intersections, they're wearing dark clothing at night, sometimes under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Usually they're distracted by having earbuds in or looking at their phone. Um, of the pedestrian fatalities that we had in the county last year, that was the case in an overwhelming majority of those. They were not crossing in an intersection. They were wearing all, all dark clothing. They were not easy to be seen. They were the ones that's a, that were at fault difficulty with this comes in how do you explain to somebody's family where their loved one was the pedestrian that they were the ones in the wrong. That's where we run into a lot of pushback on this issue. So, yes. Especially when your intersections may be one, two, three miles long, there is nowhere to cross. You can't expect a pedestrian to walk three miles one way, and then potentially three miles back across the road. Right. However, statistically speaking, that's not where we're seeing our issues. So where we are seeing our issues are where we have high concentrations of people, i.e. apartment complexes. The area of Laburnum Avenue between Richmond and Rico Turnpike and the city line would be an example of that. It's basically all apartment communities all through that area, and folks walk 
lot of folks walk the various businesses that are located in that. There's also a GRTC stop there. And to that end, we have folks who, uh, in order to get to the bus, don't go to the intersection. And there are plenty of them there within a very close proximity, but they won't go to the intersection. They cut right across the street. So 45-mile-an-hour speed limit through there. A car at 45 miles an hour is moving approximately 70 feet a second. Hard for them to stop and had a, a pretty tragic crash there last year in that particular area with roller and all of it because they were not crossing at an intersection. So I hear what you're saying, um, but where we're having our issues at or in these highly dense populated areas where there are both sidewalks and, cross, well, maybe not crosswalks, but intersections at which they can cross and people are choosing not to do that. As an interesting antidote to that, and in order to, I think I'm right, um, DPW was nice enough to put a crosswalk in front of Hermitage High School on Hungry Spring Road. If you've gone that way, you've actually seen it and noticed it, and the reason you would have noticed it, there's a big yellow sign in the middle of the street that says state law yield to pedestrian. Put that there so that the kids walk into school, it's again, all apartment, and cross at the crosswalk. But nobody uses a crosswalk. Not a one of them. Uh, my police chief travels that route every morning, laid to me, as well as other people have, that the kids cross everywhere else, um, to the point where buses have had to stop in the middle of the road, but out in the start high school kids, so older um, and we can't get them crosswalks um, so we have put together I'm gonna get back to distracted driving and kind of a so I'm we have started a campaign that we're calling watch your step so the, right at the and the reason for that is because of this rise in pedestrian fatality we're focusing on pedestrian and bicycle safety and we want our folks to do this the right way. So as you heard Mr. Yob say in the video, when you're out running or walking, you need to be doing that facing traffic. An inordinate amount of our pedestrians don't do that. They walk with traffic. That puts your back on coming cars, and you can't see what's coming. So we ask that you walk facing traffic. We ask that you don't dress all dark colored clothing. Fall in the winter, this is particularly difficult. Um, so that's why you saw Lieutenant Murrs advocating for $10 traffic and flashlights. Um, for an avid bicyclist, so I'm sure you could tell me that little flashing red light that you probably have on your bike costs, what, five bucks? If that, but wear that. There's been a lot of times that I have seen bicyclists, um, because again, I live in the Greenwood Road corridor, which is a major bike path going up to Ashland, where I've seen bicyclists that have had that flashing red strobe, and that's what I picked up on. Where I saw anything else, I saw that flashing light. So what we're doing with this campaign is we are trying to put together a regional effort, our regional public safety partners, to get out the message, um, as well as our private business partners, to get out the message about pedestrian bicycle safety. We are going to be partnering with GRTC, because I believe anecdotally that uh, their ridership is part of this population that I will call endangered in such a way that they're trying to get to the bus stop and they're not crossing at intersection. Um, we are partnering with our metro partner. We've already partnered with DMV to the point that DMV likes our program so much that they will probably co-opt and try to put it out statewide. We have applied for a, a DMV grant. It's not a lot of money but it's something so that we can try to do some enforcement in this area. And when I say enforcement, what this looks like. We have trained our officers. We went through and trained all of our officers in patrol this year, pedestrian and bicycle violations. And we asked them to stop people who are on violation, not necessarily to get a ticket, but simply to educate them as to what they're doing wrong. I would like to believe that that would be enough get most people to change their behavior. No? But that's one of the many directions that we're going with this. We're going to be doing a lot of community engagement events where we are pushing this pedestrian safety message a lot. Um, 
put together a work group that includes police, fire, Commonwealth's Attorney's Office, Virginia Department of Health, Department of Public Works, um, our, our County Public Information Office, our Fire Public Information Office, our Police Public Information Office. As this group, we meet about uh, every other month, discuss this project, see what we can do going forward, try to enhance pedestrian and bicycle safety and get that message out. Um, the first things we've done in the short term is to push out a lot of stuff online. And that's great for those people who look at it online. But if you don't subscribe to our Facebook page, if you don't subscribe to our Twitter feed, if you don't subscribe to our Instagram page, however many other ways that they put out what they put out, you will never see this. So we're also trying to get mainstream media so that they will do some stories. Try to keep this in the, uh, in the public for. Um, we had a reporter from a TV station contact us recently about this information. She wanted to do a story. She said, um, she said, I'd like to get some film somewhere to see if this is really a problem. Great. Go to Broad and Lake. For those of you not familiar, that's about where the target is. The, the Libby area, um, just up from Willow Lawn. Took her 10 minutes to film 18 violations of people running across the road. A lot of near misses. So I, I say that to say it, it's happening all over the place. And uh, we are trying to get people to do now. But I've talked about responsibility. I'll segue back to distracted driving. Um, there's a number of ways that I could talk about this, and I'll start with the most basic. Don't use your phone while you're driving a car. Um, if you are fortunate enough to have a car that has Bluetooth-enabled features, please use that. Um, because I only recently got a car that had that. It's really cool stuff, right? So I, I had no idea. Having said that, I will tell you what the law is about that. It's a secondary violation, meaning that in order for us to stop you for distracted driving, we have to have a primary violation. And in addition to that, we have to be able to see that you are doing something that is not allowed on your phone. You are allowed to use your phone to make phone calls while you're driving. You are allowed to use your GPS while you're driving. And you are allowed to look in your contact list so that you can make the phone call while you're driving. You're not allowed to surf the web, look at social media, or do any of those other things, which people do all the time. However, in order for me to enforce that, and it's not me, I have people that do that, but in order for me to enforce that, I have to be able to see what's on your phone at the time of the violation. Now, all of you, I know, pulled up to an intersection, a stop sign or whatever, and somebody else is over there and they're on their phone, right? Can you tell what they're doing? Sometimes you can, it's most of the time you can't. That's the conundrum in which we find ourselves. Um, I don't want to make this a political conversation except to point out the fact that there are a number of groups who have tried to petition the General Assembly, as they have for the last many years, to make this a primary violation and to uh, try to put some teeth into this, and it fails. And it continues to fail. So um, I say that to say to our online guests, as well as those of you that are here, is this really, when you boil it all down, is a legislative problem. The police problem that we'd like to address, but we really are kind of hamstrung by the way that the law is written, becomes a legislative problem. It can only be fixed by the General Assembly, not by the police. So. Ditto when it comes to walking and riding. Now, here's a couple things when it comes to that. If you're on your cell phone while you're walking um, and you're distracted, unless you are jaywalking or committing some other violation, but I can't do anything about that. On your bike, probably not. That would really be pushing the limits of the law to try to do anything with that in your car. That's totally different. So I say that to say that can't do a lot with that either. I, as the police, do a lot with that. Does that make sense? So having said that, 
All we can try to do is continue to push that message. You guys have no doubt seen the commercials. This is the week for the month, rather, for Click, click It or Ticket. You guys have no doubt seen some of the Click It or Ticket commercials um, that have come on recently, particularly with the guy flying through the windshield who's telling you, I didn't have time to fly before he hits the street. Very impactful. Um, DMV will continue to push that message about distracted driving as well, but regardless of how much we do that, just just can't get people while they're driving. And I really am kind of at a loss as to how to fix that problem right now. So, I wanted to tell you that so that you kind of understood the enormity of the issue, that it's not as easy as going out and stopping a person right now. With that, do you have questions about about whether um, so basically, I just would like to know about I'm new to Virginia the last couple of years. I notice uh, we have a lot of people that stand is that say specifically above them the sign that says this is an ordinance do not stand there do not give money do not do anything but it happens over and over again please stand right there we don't see any action at all my question is an unenforceable ordinance also it is a safety issue on gate the other day the woman packs up her bags she's heading out going through traffic two lanes turning left broad out of town and i'm at a loss. What are we supposed to be doing? What are you doing? I'm happy to answer that. However, I'm going to let Lieutenant Jim Price, um, who works in community services and has dealt intimately with this issue for years, um, explain to you what what the... Let's make it a so and set up a little gate so they have to... But, and if they do Traffic flowing. Jim? Thank you, Captain. I'm Jim Price. I'm the commander of community policing, crime prevention services uh, countywide. And in the recent uh, several years, we've addressed the issue of the ever increasing uh, numbers uh, of those individuals that choose to uh, attempt to collect money uh, in the public highway along the public medians, and in some cases, in the public right-of-way to the side of the intersection. Uh, the ones in the median, <clears throat> the circumstances with their presence there, uh, the Supreme Court has viewed their actions of being in the median, that's a public location, as being a location where there is a freedom of expression, a freedom of speech, and they have every opportunity to be there, and they have every right to be there according to that ruling. <clears throat> it's when they step off the median into the roadway and interfere with motor vehicle traffic that it becomes an impeding of the flow or creating a traffic hazard by the motorists that's trying to give money or give advice or whatever the contact and interchange might be with the pedestrian panhandler. But at that moment, the panhandler is subject to an arrest for a traffic infraction. We have approached on several occasions panhandlers throughout the county. Uh, at one point, we had <clears throat> 84 intersections identified in the county of Enrico as chronic locations where panhandlers were located and some of the uh, largest concentrations in numbers, sometimes one on every median all the way around the intersection, uh, were located uh, on state highways where county highways come across, Paramount Broad, Pump and Broad, Ponce Track Broad, um, 360 Mechanicsville Pike, Laburnum, Laburnum near White Oak Shopping Center, 
these areas where there's a high concentration of vehicular traffic, we would approach them and do the education and awareness piece that the captain was just speaking of. We'd hand them brochures, and the brochures really had a, a dual message. One, if you're in need of services to the point where you need to be out here asking for money, asking for help, asking for a job, then here is a resource guide for you, numbers to call. I've had citizens tell me you're handing them something for a number to call, but they're out there begging for money. How in the world are they going to call? I can assure you that nearly every panhandler I've ever had contact with have cell phones. Um, <clears throat> and they have a network. If the police are engaging with someone at Paramount Broad, everyone on Broad Street, from the city line at Staples Mill all the way out towards Goochland knows of that interchange and that exchange of information. We warn them on what is not allowed for a pedestrian to do in active travel lanes of the highway. They're allowed to be in the median, but they cannot step off into the roadway to collect their monies or do those types of things. They can only step in the roadway at those designated areas such as intersections or crosswalks to cross the road and can only do that in safety in certain speed limits above 35 miles an hour. They always should look before they step out to make sure they can do it in safety whether they have the light in the crosswalk if there's such a designation that has a, a white figure that says you're, you're able now to safely cross, you still better look. Especially with right turn on red. <laughs> you better look. Circumstances with them in the crosswalk at that moment with the light giving them that opportunity, right turn on red by a motorist, that's only allowed that you can do that in safety. That nothing's coming towards your direction from any other direction and any pedestrians that have the right of way in a situation I just described that are trying to cross in that crosswalk while everything's stopped, you have to yield to that pedestrian. Pedestrians at 35 miles an hour and below at locations where there are crosswalks, uh, I think of uh, Dominion Club Drive and Dominion Club Drive in Wyndham. There's several crosswalks with arrows and pedestrian crossing. It's a 35 mile an hour zone. If I'm a pedestrian and I walk up, it is absolutely by law incumbent upon me as a driver approaching that intersection upon seeing that pedestrian on the side to come to a stop and let that pedestrian across. Now that's a, that's a moment where I've got to look in my rear view and hope that everybody knows what I'm getting ready to do because I have to do it and do it in safety. But that is what the law dictate in that situation. 45 mile an hour zones, 40 mile an hour zones, that's not the case. They have to wait, pedestrians do, until such time as they can cross safely. Or intersections controlled by lights. Medians that you speak of were primarily designed as a physical barrier between multi-lane highways. It's a raised concrete barrier in most cases. In some cases, it's just a painted area. But the areas you speak of are raised concrete areas, and it is by law described in Virginia as a safer barrier. It's a safer barrier for if I'm crossing the road and the light changes, I have a place where I can stand in relative safety until such time as I can continue on my path and get across in safety. And now it's being used as a location to stand, sit, walk, be there to collect monies. And we really have no recourse on that other than the new signs that you see. Please do not give money to the pedestrians in the median. There's a psychological effect to that. I can tell you that it had an immediate impact on panhandlers. The one at Ponce Track and Broad advised me that the moment the sign went up, his business at that intersection of sitting there 
for six hours at a time went down by 75 percent. The people were looking and they're not going to do it. And those signs still have a psychological effect. What else is on that message? If you need help, if you're in need of services, here's the number to call. And they get those calls quite a bit, surprisingly so. And they are able to refer them to resources and help. If it genuinely is somebody who really, really is in the down and out and in dire straits and need money in that manner, much of the time it's people that are there making a quick dollar and making all right much money. So, Thank you, Jim. Um, I will tell you that we need to wrap up, but that Lieutenant Price, Officer Phillips, myself, Mr. Jennings will stay after to answer or talk to you as much as you would like us to. So I want to make that available. Ms. O'Bannon. I want to thank everyone who spoke today. They deserve a round of applause. I think we covered a lot of good information. Uh, I did not make a plan. There are no plans to have an evening. Uh, you know, usually at 6.30 we have the same town meeting at, at an evening hour. Uh, and we didn't this time because it was so close to a holiday weekend. And I got a lot of people saying they wouldn't be able to come. But I think this has been an excellent presentation. I would like to see it updated maybe this fall. And we'll come back and do it again. And we will do it at the 6.30 p.m. Uh, probably at this location, but we'll do it at the later time. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate those who watched us online. I think we covered most of the questions, if not all, that everybody had. But, of course, the gentleman will be here afterwards. Thank you very much, and we'll see you probably in about a month or so for the next town meeting. Thank you.